Hello, I'm Ron Duncan Hart of the Santa Fe Distinguished Lecture Series, and I'd like to welcome all of you who are joining us today from across the United States, Canada, and to Israel for this uh, very special program with Dr. Tomer Persico. This has been a terrible week for the people of Israel and for people of goodwill around the world who are horrified and oppose these events. Hatred is an enabling force for atrocities like the one we saw last weekend when Hamas targeted children, families, young people at a concert. We denounce the policies of terror groups who murder civilians and create suffering for everyone in the area. We are deeply concerned about the link to anti-Semitism that has grown dramatically in Western Europe and America in recent years. The goal of the Institute for Tolerance Studies, which sponsors these distinguished lectures, is to address intolerance and hatred of the other. And we thank you for joining us in this concern. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tomer Persico, whom I have known and appreciated for a number of years. He is an excellent person to walk us through the layered trauma, the multi-layered trauma, that Israel society has been confronting not only in the last week, but in recent months. He is a research fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute for Research and Education in Jerusalem. He's a Rubenstein fellow, a Koret scholar, and the author of the Jewish meditative tradition, which I'm sure he would enjoy talking about on a better occasion. He's a leading analyst of contemporary religion and deals with religion and politics and writes extensively on these topics. And we thank David and Patricia Suleman for underwriting this program, and we look forward to your questions at the end of the talk. Dr. Persico. Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much. And hello, everybody from Jerusalem. Um, I'm going to talk about religion and state in Israel. But before that, I'll, of course, say a few words about um, this week, I would say, this traumatic week. Um, really, I think, uh, I mean, I'm not going to say anything new about the loss in human life, which, of course, you know, and the atrocities that have occurred, but just to say, uh, as an Israeli, how this has affected life in Israel and, um, and how this has affected our basic sense of living here, uh, which, which it has. I would say that people are a lot more apprehensive and anxious, and this, this surprise attack and uh, the, the, the fact that it was so brutal and the fact that the IDF could not come and rescue people who were shouting for help for hours and simply shook the very core of our sense of security. Um, I, you know, I'm looking at corners and at streets and I'm locking my door. This is the level of anxiety in Israel right now. Uh, and of course, we're at war. Uh, and I will just say about that, that the big question, and perhaps we will address it in the questions and answers, the big question right now is whether Hezbollah from Lebanon will uh, intervene or not. If so, it will be a whole different ballgame. Uh, the damage Hamas has done, it has already done, but Hezbollah uh, is a stronger organization and... Uh, and uh, and can can wreak havoc uh, on on Israel. So uh, so this is a big question right now, and um, I guess we'll 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 address it later, right, Ron? Yes. Um, now, religion and state. Even eight days ago, I would have begun this talk by saying, "I'm going to talk about religion and state, but probably everything is going to change." Because, I mean, we, we've already forgotten that for the last nine months, we've had the whole judicial overhaul drama unfolding in Israel with a government that is 
unprecedentedly religious, orthodox. I mean, more than half of government members right now in the coalition are observant orthodox Jews, more than half. Never before has, been, has this been um, the reality. And, and of course, this government implements policies that for, for a, a large uh, um, section of the public are simply uh, uh, um, tainted with religious coercion and, uh, and, um, and um, uh, you know, a, a broad reach of uh, separation of uh, religion and state. So, so even before this war, there would have been a backlash against that the next elections. I would have predicted, and I did predict, that some sort of secular, militant secular Jewish uh, party will arise and try to... Uh, um, coalesce uh, voters uh, uh, supporting, etc. And so religion and state relations will in any way change. But but of course now this war has erupted and and so again things again are going to definitely change. It's harder though to know which way exactly and it really depends on what's going to happen over the last over the next few weeks. But let's go back and talk a little bit about religion and state in general in Israel. I want to show you what happened to religion and state over the last 30 years, especially uh, and really since the founding of the state, but some transitions in the last 30 years. And to um, uh, and, and, and to, to try to understand why, why has that happened, etc. So I'm going to um, pop up a PTT uh, here. And right, and 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 I'm going to begin with this. This is a flyer uh, posted on Tel Aviv streets in 1933, where the municipality, the the um, the city hall, is asking Tel Aviv residents. Right, I'm, I'm I've translated it on the side. Remember that the Sabbath is the greatest historical symbol of national solidarity, and anyone who harms it harms the unity of Israel. We hope that the cultured and mature public of our city would note our request and not cause quarrels between brothers desecrating the Sabbath in public. So this is Mayor Meir Dizengoff, 1933, before the state was founded, of course, asking the residents of Tel Aviv not to desecrate the Sabbath in public. You know, at your home, do whatever you like, but etc. Exhibit B is this. This is a flyer by one of the uh, opposition or resistance um, groups, NGOs, that have sprung up like mushrooms after the rain uh, over the last uh, nine months. And, and this is, it's called Koach Kaplan, Kaplan Force, uh, right uh, after the streets that uh, demonstrations are held in, in Tel Aviv. And it says, on Friday, we are uh, we are drawing a red line on religious coercion. Come at two o'clock to one of the stations in the list, etc. What does it refer to? It refers to Tel Aviv's uh, light rail beginning to operate finally after tens of years, decades of planning, but not operating on the Sabbath. The train is new, but it's not going to operate on the Sabbath because uh, there's no public transportation on the Sabbath in general in Israel. And so there's a demonstration against that. So on one hand, Tel Aviv uh, is suffering from a sort of religious coercion where there's no public transportation on the Sabbath. On the other hand, there is this militant uh, um, reaction to that, a demonstration where people would handcuff themselves to the light rail on Friday afternoon before it closes down. So that's what we're talking about, and this is 2023, exactly 90 years from that, from this, right? What happened? What happened between this and this? How should we understand uh, these changes? And to do that, we need to begin at the beginning, and that's the what we call the status quo. Israel has a status quo on religion and state, which is really a code name for what we think should be 
uh, it's flexible and liquid and, and, and you know, never was a real um, uh, uh, solid status quo, but it's based on a letter that Ben Gurion sent to the ultra-Orthodox Agudat Israel organization in June 47. And in that letter, Ben Gurion promised a few promises about religion and state relations in Israel that have since then been the mainstay of religion and state relations in Israel. There are four promises here, and I'm quoting of a direct translation. Sabbath. Clearly, the official day of rest in the Jewish state will be the Sabbath, right? And then governmental offices were closed, etc. Kosher. We will do the best we can to ensure every state kitchen meant to be used by Jews will be kosher. So hospitals, police, governmental offices, of course, are kosher. Family laws. We will do everything possible in order to satisfy the deep need of keepers of religion to prevent a split of the house of Israel into two. What does that mean? Uh, it means, it means uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to break it down uh, uh, specifically, but it basically means that all marriages and divorces will be held under the chief rabbinate in Israel in order for there not to be a suspicion of mamzerim, of the Jewish halachic bastards, right? Mamzerim. And so the house of Israel will be split in two if Orthodox people will suspect that some seculars or all seculars are mamzerim or safek mamzerim, uh, 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 suspected mamzerim, and then not be able to marry each other. Okay, so marriages are only in the chief rabbinate. And finally, education, a full autonomy of every branch of education will be a promise. Okay, now I want to go over the first three promises here on the list and see how they developed over the decades of Israel's existence. And by doing that, we will see what has, uh, what has changed in the Israeli status quo of religion and state. Let's look about at Sabbath struggles. In 1951, Israeli labor law is legislated forbidding work on the Sabbath for Jews, except uh, emergency services, etc. 1965, Edison Cinema in Jerusalem is torched for selling tickets on the Sabbath, tickets for a movie. Okay. In 1976, the government falls, under, falls after a reception ceremony of F-15s held on Friday afternoon. So the U.S. gave Israel F-15s. They flew from the States to Israel, landing on Friday afternoon. It was a big deal in 1976. So the government was there to receive these wonderful machines, right? But they could not go get home in time before the Sabbath. So the government, so the secular, you know, government officials that were there desecrated the Sabbath and the government forms. The government, the, the, the religious parties in the government withdraw uh, and government falls. This is the first Rabin government, by the way. 1984, the struggle to open Heichal Cinema in Petah Tikva. Petah Tikva wants one cinema to be open on the Sabbath. There's a great civic struggle around this. Uh, I'm not going to go into it, but just to understand the proportions. 1987-94 struggles concerning the closing of major roads in Jerusalem on the Sabbath, and gov uh, government breaks up because transferring part of an electric turbine on the Sabbath in 1999. Okay, so this is what Shabbat struggles looked like in the last decades. Cultural legislation. The Pork Law in 1962 prohibits the raising, keeping, and slaughtering of pigs in Israel. In 1980, the chief rabbinate law states that only it has permission to administer kosher certificates to businesses and has a copyright on the word kosher. Okay, so the rabbinate gives you a certificate if your cafe or restaurant is kosher. And not only that, you cannot even write your own certificate saying this place is kosher. I am responsible for it, Tomer. That's against the law because kosher is a word that only the, the rabbinate can use. 1981. A law is suggested by religious parties aimed to prohibit selling pork, failing to get legislated. So that's selling of pork, not raising and slaughtering of pork. But we can still buy pork in Israel. Another attempt is made in 85, 86. The Hametz law prohibits displaying and selling of Hametz on Passover. So according to the law, you cannot buy 
chametz on Passover, or he could not eat a bagel in a restaurant. The, the law is not enforced, but... And uh, 2023, an amendment to the Hametz law prohibits displaying Hametz in you know, Passover in hospitals. So if you're going to the hospital, you can't take your sandwich with you. Okay. Marriage. 53, rabbinical courts law states that the Jews can only get married and divorced through the chief rabbinic's rabbinical courts. 63, Supreme Court verdict instructs the state to register those who are married abroad as married. So only... So Jews can only marry in Israel through the rabbinical courts. That's, first of all, of course, religious coercion, because I have to have a rabbi issued to me by the chief rabbinate in my own marriage. But it's not only that. If I am a Kohen and I want to marry a divorcee, I cannot get married in Israel. I cannot get married in my own state. If I am a Jew that is suspected by the chief rabbinate not to be Jewish, and I can't prove that I'm Jewish, I cannot get married. If I am LGBT, I cannot get married. So what happens in 63 is the Supreme Court says, yeah, but if you got married outside of Israel, we recognize it. Uh, so, so uh, And then common law marriage over the decades of Israel's court system established it at the top of Western countries regarding common law marriage rights. This is the flip side of the marriage law because there are so many people who cannot get married. Common law, which means simply living together for some time, you become common law married, right? You're recognized as a couple by law. Uh, and it, it is one of the most progressive laws uh, in the world because people have no choice. They, they, they need their rights, right? 19, uh, 2006 Supreme Court verdict instructs the state to register same-sex couples who married abroad as married. So you can't get married in Israel, but you can marry abroad and you're registered. And 2013, the law is amendment. Uh, the law amendment decrees up to two years in prison for halachic wedding outside of the chief rabbinate. Yes, you read this correctly. If a couple gets married halachically. Out and does not register itself in the chief rabbinate, it is a felony, and you can get up to two years in prison. Now, this law was never enforced, and it will never be enforced, I'm sure, because this is obviously completely ludicrous, but that's the law, okay? Let's see now what happened with these three issues uh, in their secularization process. So Shabbat secularization. Right in 1990, shopping malls in the 1990s, sorry, shopping malls began to open on the Sabbath in Israel. We didn't have that before. At the same time, a convenience store pop up in Israel that are open 24/7. In 1994, shared taxis on the Sabbath received legal legitimization. So there's not there's no buses, but they are shared taxis. Today, there is no major city in Israel without many cinema houses open on the Sabbath. So remember the struggles to open one cinema in Petah Tikva in 86. Today, every major city, including Jerusalem, has many cinema houses open on the Sabbath. And finally, this is a historic day. I'm bringing a headline from a newspaper here. Tel Avivians hope buses on the Sabbath are just the beginning. The Tel Aviv municipality funds public transportation of its own on the Sabbath, in which people don't pay, because it's illegal to pay for public transportation on the Sabbath. So the municipality funds buses that simply pick people up and carry them to, let's say, the beach, if they want to, and they're not paying. But it's public transportation on the Sabbath. So that's a big wow in 2019 when it happened. And finally, this is a list of shopping malls open on the Sabbath in the entire uh, Israel, more than 20, and every normal weekend, hundreds of thousands of Israelis shop on the Sabbath. Okay, so Israel, obviously, even from these examples, and I will go into other issues soon, has come through a dramatic process of secularization of its public sphere over the last 30 years, since the 90s, basically. And we will have to address and ask ourselves why this was the case. Uh, this is the poll, uh, public consultation on the Sabbath. As you can see, 
45% say yes, but limited. 27% say as any other day. So that's a very big majority that wants some sort of public consultation on the Sabbath. 10% want nothing. 18% leave it as it is. Okay. And, and, and of course, I come back to this flyer protesting against the light rail in Tel Aviv suspending its action on the Sabbath. Kashrut. Kashrut has had a long story, a long developing story over the last, I would say, decade with many different private initiatives in different parts of the country popping up and saying, I will give cafes and restaurants private kashrut, private kosher certificate, even, and, and it will, and I'm not going to use the word kosher, so it's going to be supervised by, without the word kosher, right, supervised by Rabbi Tomer, let's say, uh, so it's not illegal, right, but, uh, but it breaks the monopoly of the chief rabbinate, and finally, uh, in the last, um, in the former government, the former more uh, you know, the, the, the non-Netanyahu government, Bennett and Lapid, etc., there was a, a there was a, a reform in the Kashrut uh, um, facilities in Israel. And here Bennett, as Prime Minister, says, for decades everyone talked about the corruption, the culture of the jobs, you know, people getting yeah, nepotism, basically, and stuff, <laughs> and the exorbitant prices in the Kashrut system, but did nothing. The Minister of Religion, Matan Kahana, arrived and performed. That's it. There is competition in kosher regulation. That's how we work. This time legislated by the government, competition, not exactly breaking the monopoly of the rabbinate, but letting rabbinate municipal rabbis issue their own kosher certificate, meaning basically that you can get more lenient rabbis to to, to certify your cafe as kosher and opening up the market that way. Um, and of course, this government, this is the headlines of the newspaper, first order of business with the new government, cancel the kosher reform, right? So this government has been reactionary towards any progress in religion and state uh, relations. <clears throat> Some data, uh, who is keeping kosher? 13% at home, not outside. 2% outside, not at home, for some reason. Everywhere, 48%. And no kosher, 37%. But how many people want uh, to keep the chief rabbinate's kosher monopoly? Only 18%. 29% say abolish it. Only the orthodox entities may offer services. And 52% abolish it. Anyone can offer services. So there's no, you know, not, not much love for the chief rabbinate uh, kosher's uh, facilities in Israel. And finally, marriage secularization. Uh, I bring you a headline from 2019. Fewer Israelis marrying through the chief rabbinate report shows the Ministry of Religious Services attributes the rock to general changes in marriage trends. However, the report is evidence of the growing contempt in Israel towards the rabbinate and the power it wields. Uh, there are less and less Jews in Israel marrying through the chief rabbinate, preferring instead either to be counted as common law marriage or to be married abroad or to be married in one of the three NGOs I bring your I bring the logos of uh, in the right of the screen, Mishpacha Chadashat, Kasim, and Havaya, each offering alternative Hoopas, alternative marriages for Jews, some illegal, as you saw before, and uh, and giving an alternative to people who don't want to marry to the chief rabbi. This is support for all types of marriage through the years. As you can see, it is growing very uh, uh, pronouncedly. Though I have the uh, in the, the last few years there has been a drop today in or at least in 2022 only 62 it's not only but 62 percent uh, support all types of marriage and when I say all types of marriage it's civil marriage and LGBT marriage okay so a great majority in the Israeli public want civil marriage and want you know anyone to be married to whoever they love 
Uh, but as we said, the law is different and there's uh, religious coercion on that account in Israel. So I'm going to sum up. How do we come from here to here, right? From Tel Avivians or the, the mayor of the secular mayor of Tel Aviv asking Tel Avivians not to desecrate the Sabbath on uh, public. And these, this list of shopping malls open every Saturday, every Sabbath in Israel. What happened? But what happened, and I'll, I'll stop the PPT for a minute, what happened is that Israel went through a dramatic process of liberalization over the last, uh, uh, over the la since the 90s, I'm sorry, wait a minute. I'm trying to fix my camera, yeah. Um, the 90s have, um, I mean, the, the, the Likud, came into power first time in 77, the first time Israel did not have basically a socialist government, and immediately began process of liberalization of the market. The 80s brought that further, even when the labor uh, came back to power in different uh, fashions. And uh, basically it was unstoppable and Israel became part of the global market. But becoming part of the global market liberalized not only Israel's economy, but also, as is always the case, the society. Israel, um, I mean, uh, liberalization introduced into Israel a new form of individualism, a new form of self-fulfillment ethos. And Israelis became more individualized and more uh, concerned about their own autonomy. So on one hand, the market became much more liberal and offered opportunities that were never before uh, available for Israelis. And on the other hand, Israelis demanded it. They wanted not only to shop on Sabbath, which became available, but also to marry the way they wanted to. So the Sabbath and even rabbinical marriage was some sort of symbol, not even a religious symbol, but a national symbol. When the state was founded, certainly in 33, but also in 48, when David Ben Gurion could promise these promises of the status quo letter to Agudat Israel, to the ultra Orthodox, in 1947, counting on them being important for the vast majority of Israelis as national symbols, as simply part of the Jewish culture, that was not the case from the 90s on, where Israelis were concerned more of, I mean, or, or adopting a, a, an individualist ethos and ethos and they, a, and identifying themselves with Western or American culture in general. And that's why um, Israel has, has gone through such a shift. But one final word before I, uh, I end, and I want to again, uh, share my screen. I want to show you what happened over the last uh, um, government, right? What happened um, over the last few months? And what happened is, a second. what happened is this government has, has done something strange. I, I bring you the political map in Israel uh, basically uh, rudimentarily uh, divided into left and right and also secular and religious. And you can see, and I, 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 these logos are in uh, Hebrew, I hope it's understood. This is the Tzionut Adati, the religious uh, Zionist, Yadut HaTorah and Shas, the ultra-Orthodox parties, the Likud. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll color this maybe. Okay, so this is the Likud here. This is Gantz, Amachane Amamlachti. This is Lapid, Yashatid, Labour Party, Meretz, and a Victor Libra and Israel Beitenu. Why the Likud was always on the verge of being religious, but more traditional, certainly not militantly secular like some of the more left wing parties, but, but not orthodox uh, in any way. But what happened over the last few years is that changed. The Likud became a much more religious party, even in personal, even, I mean, even in, 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 in the people that occupy the seats of the Likud, they are simply orthodoxly religious. And so if this is the map now, right, not this, but this, you can see that the divide, the political divide becomes not only a divide 
between left and right, right? Between this cluster of left and this cluster of right um, parties, it, oops, sorry. It becomes a divide between religious and secular, between this cluster here and this cluster here. Sorry, with this, right? A new dynamic has been introduced into the Israeli political system, a dynamic that not divides it not according to the left and right axis, but to the religious secular axis, or I might more to the point say orthodox, non-orthodox Jewish axis. And if that is the case, this tension immediately changes the, polit changes the political field. I want to bring you two, uh, 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 two illustrations of this. Uh, on the right, you have Lieberman's um, political uh, ad uh, in one of the last election rounds. He says, Yes to a Jewish state, not to a halachic state. I think a brilliant... Uh, a slogan that says, yes, I'm for Jewish identity, but not halachic theocracy, obviously. And on your left, there is Netanyahu tweeting on Twitter, Medinat Israel lo tiyem Medinat halacha. Israel will not become a halachic state, will not become a theocracy. Netanyahu has to tweet this out because he, his coalition is conceived as bringing Israel into a into a situation of a halachic state, and he wants to reassure his secular voters, no, don't worry about it. Yes, we're a religious coalition, but you know we're not going to even more religiously coerce Israelis than what is now. So where we, eight days ago, I would already tell you that things are going to change in the, in the next elections, because this new tension in the Israeli political system shuffles the cards again, and, 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 and a lot of secular people are fed up with religious coercion, and certainly after the growing liberalization of the last few decades, and, and this threatens them and, is, uh, and, and, and it worries them a lot, the, the, the new religious coalition. So, so things will certainly change the status quo. Now, of course, there's bigger worries to be concerned about. And here I will end and open for, and Ron, I will give you the mic uh, to please uh, ask me or whatever. So right. thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for um, giving us this overview of what's been happening. And, you know, one of the things uh, that I wonder, you, you talk about the shift in, in Likud, um, and I, I would like to ask, how does this relate to the increasing Mizrahi influence in Likud that I've been hearing about? So the Likud has always had a, a prominent Mizrahi presence, uh, influence. This, is, this was one of Begin's, Menachem Begin's 77 uh, ways to, to take power. I mean, he reached out to these voters which were discriminated against uh, by the labor movement. Uh, they felt they were second-class citizens and Begin, and Begin really had a way to talk to them and to, you know, and to uh, approach them that the labor movement didn't have and perhaps didn't want to. Uh, so that was always the case, but always in the Likud, there was also the other side of the Likud, which was historically even liberal in principle. And I'm, I'm talking liberal, not, not in the American progressive sense of the world. I'm saying classical liberalism, right? Uh, uh, human rights, autonomy for the individual, rule of law, etc. right? That's liberal, right? And so they could, since, since the days that Menachem Begin founded the Herut, Party, which became the Likud later, Herut, freedom, in Hebrew, uh, was always had, always had a very strong liberal side. So it had the Mizrahi more traditional side, and it had a very prominent liberal side, which with members of Knesset like Dan Meridor and Miki Eitan and Ruby Rivlin and people who were very committed liberals. 
But what happened over the last decade is that Netanyahu, one by one, got rid of them. Or it's not only Netanyahu, it's certainly by his leadership, but, but the Likud uh, inner uh, uh, vo- um, voting system simply pushed them out. Uh, for others, for others who are more traditional, less liberal, sometimes anti-liberal, and, uh, and sometimes even orthodoxly religious. That's what happened to the Likud. And so it, it became a party which was traditional on the verge of orthodox with no liberal side to balance things out. You know, an, another issue that um, you have written about, and I'm, I'm wondering how this factors into uh, the things you're talking about, um, you, you've written about the, the settler movement and how this is, because there's a religious connection there sometimes, um, and how it's affect, affecting the politics. I'm, okay, I mean, this is, I would say this is the most prominent influence on politics and what, on what happens in Israel over the last 50 years or, or 40 the settler movement, headed by Gush Emunim in the from the middle of the 70s, 70s onward, changed the geography of Israel, changed the politics of Israel, changed the society of Israel. It, it changed the entire trajectory of the Jewish state. Uh, Israel began populating Judea and Samaria and the Gaza Strip invested huge amounts of funds, energy, uh, and political uh, um, uh, motivation in this project. And for and now, invest that amount also in protecting that project. I mean, we can go into the politics of what's happening in Gaza now. It's also connected to the West Bank, Netanyahu. I mean, Hamas... Uh, Hamas took power in Gaza in 2007 by a political uh, coup, right? Uh, uh, A putsch, um, violence. Um, Netanyahu got to power in 2009 on the explicit promise to topple Hamas. This is 2009. From 2009 till this day, Netanyahu has made it, it made it his job to support Hamas, to bring funds to Hamas from other countries, to not to endanger Hamas's rule in Gaza in any way. And why? He said so himself. This is quotable, right? He said, if you want to prevent the two-state solution, you have to keep the Palestinians split between the uh, Palestinian Authority and the Hamas. If there are two entities, you cannot negotiate with them. There's, you cannot have a process that leads eventually to a two-state solution. So that's why Netanyahu kept the Hamas alive. Again, in his words, right? So the settler movement, the a religious Zionist, influenced Israel so much that for the preservation of their flag project, settlements in Judea and Samaria, the Hamas in Gaza was kept alive till this day. And now, of course, we know what the end uh, uh, result was. That is astonishing. Um, and, and, and we talk, I mean, you know, Bezalel Smotrich, right? Our Minister of uh, Finance, Bezalel Smotrich said on camera, Hamas is an asset, we need to keep it right. This is this, it, this is a right wing, you know, ultra right wing minister in the government saying that you, you we want Hamas to be able to control Gaza. Why again? Because of because we don't want a two state solution. So this was briefly addressed before, um, but given all this, the the events um, that have taken place in the last few days, um, what is your anticipation about how this is going to impact? There will be an election after the war, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I mentioned. I, I don't think I mentioned to you before. I don't think they heard it. Uh, I, I, you know, I, again, with Netanyahu, you can never say never, but I can't see how Netanyahu evades doom after the war. Uh, this is a catastrophe and a debacle in, you know, 
it's not historic even, it's biblical proportions. It's it's just, I mean, Netanyahu, who many times said that he wants to be remembered as the protector of Israel, has failed at the single most important goal he set for himself, all right? Israel is now, I mean, ha- um, was struck by the, the 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 greatest catastrophe since the Holocaust, basically. So and so, I don't see how he gets out of this. There, I I would say that the, when the war ends, the government will break up. There will be elections, and that now will be voted out. Um, but but it again it remains to be seen how the war, uh, you know, progresses. As I said before, the greatest fear now is that Hezbollah will enter and really all hell will break loose. You know, one of the other issues that is um, beginning to come into focus on the mass media now, of course, is the Israeli uh, retaliation in Gaza. And, um, of course, we're beginning to see this shift in the news away from the tragedies of last weekend to... um, the uh, the destruction that's happening in Gaza. One of the things that um, every when I see this come back to mind, Thomas Friedman's talk about the Hama rules um, that that occurred in Syria, uh, and he made the suggestion that this is the way the Middle East works. Um, yeah, I I mean. Israel is in, an, is in an impossible situation in which it is fighting a terrorist organization that uses civilians as armor, as bodyguards, right? And and that, that's the whole reason that uh, of Hamas. It is in its own people. It's not an army. It's a terrorist organization. And it's at the moment, as we speak, blocking roads so that Gazans won't be able to run away south in the Gaza Strip from Israel's bombing in the north after Israel has told them, go south, we are going to decimate the north, right? And they want to do it, and Hamas blocks their way. So, I mean, so that's the situation. Um, but, But Friedman is right, I think, in a way that Israel's response here is here has to be remembered as a as a traumatic event in the history of Gaza. It it cannot be if if Israel responds in a way that simply you know uh, punishes Hamas in a way and 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 lets go. The next next week or next year, we will have Hezbollah doing the same thing from the north. Hezbollah has to know that if it opens fire from the north, its own quarter of Beirut city will be decimated completely. And so, in a way, Israel has no choice but to show, but to make an example of part of the Gaza Strip now in the same way. Um, I don't. Think, I really don't think there's an, a, a, a choice, and of course, Israel has to, you know, notify the civilians to get out of the way as it does. But what you said is also true that images are coming out of Gaza that are horrendous, and I think we are all on borrowed time, as we say on in Israel. I, I'm, I try, I'm translating as Israel uh, Hebrew expression. We are all. The time is running out, and it really remains to see how far Israel can go uh, inside Gaza and what it can do. Of course, again, with the little caveat here, we have to see what Hezbollah does also. We have a number of questions that are coming in from the audience. Um, Bonnie Ellinger asks, what would you say that there is a direct line between the unprecedented orthodox government established by Netanyahu and his Likud party and the attack by Hamas last weekend? Um, That's a difficult question. Obviously, this attack was planned for a long time, right? It's not anything spontaneous. Uh, It was planned, I would uh, wager, uh, I think it's almost certain, with the help of Iran, 
uh, much funds and expertise were, uh, uh, you know, used here. And so Hamas was preparing for this for a long time. That said, certainly the state that Israel is in right now, in, in its weakness, invited such an attack. So if Hamas was debating within itself when to attack, certainly the last nine months have shown the Israeli society fracturing and the Israeli army fracturing and laying a bare a weakness that Hamas knew how to exploit. Uh, uh, we have to mention this. Army experts, army generals, even the ch chief of staff talked to Netanyahu and told him time and again, "We are you are weakening the army. We are at a vulnerable situation and our enemies will be... Uh, tempted to abuse it. Please watch out. This has been told to Netanyahu time and again, and he simply ignored it. Um, Steve Levy uh, says, as good as the IDF is, they can only be in one place at, at, at one time. Could the recent massacre, massacre have been mitigated if military resources hadn't been prioritized to protect West Bank settlers? I think certainly so. I mean, uh, this is one of the questions that has been uh, right uh, in the heat of a public polemic over the last week. Where was or where were the army units that usually are stationed around Gaza? I mean, these guys broke through the fence on pickup trucks and simply drove away, right? They didn't have any... Uh, you know, obviously some army was there, but they basically did whatever they wanted for hours. And it's now known that a a, a gdud and a half, what's a gdud in, in English? I actually don't know, but it's it's a few hundred, it's 500 to 1,500 soldiers. This amount of soldiers and a half were, was relocated from around the Gaza Strip to uh, the West Bank uh, um, two days before. And why? Because the West Bank is bubbling. I'm not saying there's no security concerns in the West Bank. Obviously, there are. But it was bubbling also because of, um, you know, uh, this vigilante settler activity, settler violent activity towards, towards the Palestinians in the West Bank. The West Bank has been bubbling for... The last few months, as, as you know, you, you, you must have heard of the Hawara, you know, I'm not going to say the word, but Jewish settlers coming into the village of Hawara setting houses on fire, right? Uh, so, the, so the army now has to relocate soldiers in order to protect not only settlers, but also Palestinians from settlers, right? And, and obviously there was not enough army around the Gaza Strip because of that. I'm not saying that the Hamas anyway took us by surprise, but the amount of uh, um, the, the tragedy would have been much smaller were there enough uh, soldiers around Gaza. Um, to, to summarize a question from Halle Faust, he asks about, uh, essentially about, why hasn't there been able to build a coalition around the secular trends in Israel? The, because we we saw in the statistics you were giving that there are these prominent secular trends. Uh, are they being reflected in politics? Yeah, that's a good question. There's a great majority for civil marriage in Israel. There's a big majority for public transportation on the Sabbath. There's a big majority for opening up the kosher market. What What's stopping people from actually legislating this? What's stopping them is, sorry, is that... A, when you come to the ballot box, you don't vote on religion and state. You care deeply about religion and state, but you care more about your security and about economy. So usually people vote for security. They, they, they want to either, you know, uh, get the peace process going or defend the settlements or whatever, right? Or, or right, uh, object to the two-state solution or whatever. And they vote for someone who they think is a good businessman and can get the economy running and whatever, right? And, and religion and state usually comes only third and you just don't vote about it. So the parties that get into parliament and get co into the coalition, into government, that's not the, their top priority, if at all. That's the reason. 
again, I would say that were not this war, I would have wagered, I would uh, um, um, anticipated uh, this time there would be a militantly secular separation of religion and state party uh, running for parliament and, and probably uh, succeeding getting a few seats in parliament. Russ Resnick uh, asks how this uh, the the current unity government uh, might influence the, the next election, the next round of will, will it uh, how did, uh, will it affect the diminish the influence of right wing religious parties? What what do you see? The unity government, I don't think it will affect so much. I mean, uh, people see it as uh, I mean as as something that has has to be done in war. <laughs> Of course, Gantz and uh, Eisenkot, the two generals uh, that uh, uh, joined Netanyahu's uh, government, are very experienced, and that's a sigh of relief for for uh, a lot of people in Israel that somebody with experience is there. Not that I'm saying that Netanyahu himself does not have experience. He has a lot of experience, and also Gallant, his minister of security. But again, two, two prominent figures like that make a difference. But I don't think that will change voting trends. As it looks like right now, and again, the war can go any way, anywhere, but 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 for months now, Gantz has been the main beneficiary of Netanyahu's uh, decline, I would say, the whole judicial overhaul uh, drama that was seen by most citizens of Israel as something that they either don't understand and don't even connect to, or something that is very frightening for them, right? I mean, even Likud voters wanted the government to take care of the economy and to take care of security, which was not very good even before the war, and not bother themselves about changing the makeup of the judging, the judges, uh, um, the judicial, the, 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 the committee that elects judges so so again so i don't i as it looks like now Gantz will be the next prime minister but again i you know i even this we really really need to wait for to see how the war ends and 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 what happens uh, linda Sean giddings asks about how these events the last week would affect the pro democracy movement in Israel that has been forming in, in recent months? Uh, obviously, the focus has, shift, has shifted, and um, and people are now concerned about different things entirely. But I don't think what happened over the last nine months will be forgotten. Uh, again, if Hezbollah enters, if there is a catastrophe of a magnitude that we can't even imagine, if 10,000 Israeli civilians die from Hezbollah rockets, which is not impossible, sadly. Uh, then I don't know. Then anything can happen. But but if this war, if, if Hezbollah does not intervene, which I really hope it won't, uh, and if this war is over in a month or two, uh, then I think the agenda will be back. Will be back on the ballot in the next elections and the next government, which again probably will not be a Netanyahu government, will will legislate things the other way, will secure the power of the Supreme Court probably, and maybe even give us a few uh, laws that um, uh, decrease the, the religious coercion in Israel. Douglas Colton asks um, how this the, the increasing influence of the Orthodox uh, parties in Israel, um, how has that contributed to tensions with the Palestinian territories? Uh, so we, we need to differentiate between ultra-Orthodox and religious Zionists. The ultra-Orthodox have nothing to do with the Palestinians. They want to secure their own autonomy. Education-wise, they want to. They wanted a law that exempts them from enlistment in the army completely. 
and lawfully right now they're exempt, but it's not very legal. It's it's, the, yeah, it's you know the the authorities are looking the other way basically. So so and and so they don't have anything to do with the Palestinians, but the religious Zionists certainly do, of course. As we said, their flagship project is the settler uh, uh, the settlements in the West Bank, and they were a large part, if not the most prominent part, pushing this judicial overhaul also with direct connection to the settlements because for some, uh, the next uh, probable and, 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 uh, and uh, 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 what they want to do in the occupied territories is full annexions, annex, annexation, sorry, of the West Bank. And if Israel annexes the West Bank, they don't want a strong Supreme Court to tell them that they have to neutralize the Palestinians. They have to give everyone equal rights and citizenship. They don't want that. And in order not to have that, they want to neuter the Supreme Court preemptively. Okay, so definitely that was a large part of the force propelling the judicial overhaul uh, forward. And, and even in, in different, more minute details, like they don't want the Supreme Court to tell them, listen, you built this house in that settlement on private property of this and this Palestinian, you need to demolish it and 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 you know, because it's private property, it's not state property as it were, it's not like nationalized uh, land. And that also is something that they don't want the court to be able to do anymore. anymore. So in general, for them, the judicial overhaul was something that needed, that was needed by the settlement uh, project. You know, you just uh, raised the question of uh, this, the like the 800 pound girl in the room in a sense, uh, the, um, you know, the, the tra tradition about the growing sentiment in Israel of a one state solution annexing Judea and Samaria. Um, the what do you see from where you are? So this sentiment is real among different parts of the religious Zionist public. As I said, the more extreme parts, obviously, the parts are represented now in government. We have today in parliament. I mean, the party of the religious Zionists in parliament is wholly the most extreme religious Zionists there are. Right? You've got Hili Trooper and Matan Kahana in Gantz's party. They are mainstream religious Zionists, right? Knitted skull cap that are middle-class, <laughs> educated Israelis, liberal, basically. But smart rich, obviously Ben Gvir, and their party members are very extreme. I mean, I mean, it's not a coincidence, it's not, you know, by chance that no official from the US or from any European country met our finance minister for the last year, right? For the last nine months. They don't want to meet him because he had expressed racist views in the past, homophobic views in the past. These are the most extreme religious Zionists. And for them, yes, the one state solution, meaning really annexation without the realization of the Palestinians is what they want. Even I would say, Worse than that, because they would basically they would really want to kick the Palestinians out, right? To 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 have them run away, say in very simple words. Um, but I wanted to say another thing, which I forgot. You asked an, a, a, on a specific angle of this, Ron. Yeah, the, the, the you know the uh, yeah. yeah, I remember that. Got no, it. but what, yeah, what do you want to say? Go ahead. And so what, what I want to say is that really this war in Gaza also opens this question up because on the one hand, we have got right now religious Zionist extremists who say not only are we going to conquer the Gaza Strip, but we're going to set in the Gaza Strip. We are going to remake the old settlements that were there until 2005, until the disengagement, and we're going to even broaden the Jewish settlement inside the Gaza Strip. That's their dream now, right? <clears throat> so on the one hand, we have that, which is 
again, it's completely implausible. It's, it's not going to happen, but that's what they're saying. And on the other hand, remember what I said before about Netanyahu's wish to keep Hamas alive in order for the two-state solution to be non, not viable. If we are, if Israel is going to actually cripple Hamas, I don't believe it will annihilate Hamas, but let's say it makes Hamas unable to politically control the Gaza Strip. Who will control the Gaza Strip? Israel, the Palestinian Authority. Any way you turn it around, we have a situation in which suddenly the path towards the two-state solution is a bit more viable because if the Palestinian Authority controls the Gaza Strip, we have one entity which we can negotiate with for all the Palestinians, right? Now, again, it looks very far away right now. Israel is in a terrible trauma. The public opinion has shifted right on Palestinian issues, have no doubt about that. After that massacre, people are more right-wing. But we never know. And I want to re remind uh, us that after the terrible trauma of the Yom Kippur War in 73, only five years after that, a peace agreement, or six years, sorry, a peace agreement between Israel and Egypt was signed. So Egypt was the greatest enemy of Israel. It caught Israel by surprise in 73, the Yom Kippur War. 79, Begin and Sadat signed a peace treaty in Camp David in, uh, under the uh, offici uh, officiated by uh, President Carter. So, you know, I'm not the you know I'm, I'm not going to I'm, I don't want to to you know to give false hopes uh, uh, and this is a terrible time in Israel but but uh, but but things can change and 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 I hope they do. Another concern that's been expressed by more than one person in the questions um, is um, how should. Jews in the United States and, and people who are concerned about this situation, what can best be done here? Now, I'm not sure, I don't know if that's a fair question to you, but um, if, if you have a thought on that. You know, I, have, I have a thought. So, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to talk about donations. Obviously, you know who to donate to if you want. But I will say this. I think one of the most important, if not the most important moment of this war over the last week was the speech by President Biden. Yeah. Biden flanked by uh, uh, Kamala Harris and um, uh, Blinken and Secretary Blinken telling Israelis that the United States sees them, it is concerned, and it has their back. And I really think that you could have, you know, there was a palpable sigh of relief in Israel seeing Biden talk that way. It was, I'm, I'm really, I, I cannot express the amount of emotion that speech brought to Israelis and, and the relief and the, the some renewed sense of security for Israelis because, and you know, and, and obviously backing that up with action and bringing um, um, the the the, um, the carriers. How do you say that? The the, 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 the carrier grouping. Yeah. The, 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 no plane carriers. How do you say that? The, the amazingly big ships with planes on them. Aircraft the Mediterranean. Um, so 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 if 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 you want to help, you know. Make sure that the United States um, um, <clears throat> support for Israel stays strong. That's, I would say, that's the most important thing. Write to your congressman or uh, demonstrate, or I don't know, because this for for Israelis, the fact that the the president of the United States has their back is supremely important. It's really, really reassuring. Tomer, there, um, Corinne Brown and a number of others in the uh, the chat and the Q and A have uh, expressed a thank you to you for this 
talk and for uh, outlining the, the the various factors that are going on in Israel now. And uh, we want to thank you for being here, for sharing this with us. And um, we look forward to further con conversations in the future. They're always good. Me too, me too. Thank you, Ron, for inviting me. And it was my pleasure. And thank you all. And I hope uh, I hope we will hear good news very quickly and all be safe. So thank you for being here with us today. And um, again, thank you, Tomer. Thank you.